You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. And welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. It is Monday, August Yay. 8th, 2022. How you doing, Christina Dennis? We've been off for a I week know. here. I know. Welcome vacation. back. Yes, I'm doing welcome great, Welcome back. Frank. I know. Damon Frank, did you have a good vacation? Um, you know what? It was really good. I went to the East Coast, saw a lot of historical stuff that I liked, uh, which is always fun for me. I'm a little bit nerdy that way. I know your uh-huh. husband's like that as well. Yeah, he is. So was able to see a bunch of stuff that I'd never seen that I'd always like watched on the History Channel and learned in school and read in books. So it was great. It was a, it was a good break. And it was good to kind of be off the show for a while because it I listened to some older episodes Mm -hmm. And it gave me a fresh perspective of what we want to do the rest of the summer. Oh, I love it. I love it. It was beautiful here in Southern California, I have to say. So, and it was nice to have a week with my son. So I'm so glad that we did it. We have to practice what we preach. I'm so glad. You you always have to take some break. You know, you have to take breaks. Uh, We're going to be doing an episode about that in the future. Taking breaks is really good. You know, both Christine and I, I would say, Christina, wouldn't you, that we're both kind of the workaholic type. We'll go, 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 go. Uh, And I know you're right by the beach, so you have some beach time that you can do. And just being able to take out a week or so and not be on that treadmill is good Mm -hmm. as much as we love it. But I got to tell you, I, I, if you listen, if you're a regular listener, of the Recovered Life show, I missed you guys. I missed Christina going yes. on, uh, you know, every couple of days and, you know, having this recovery uh, conversation. Oh, it's a, it's it's so good for my own recovery and people respond in such a beautiful way. I did too. And we have an exciting episode today. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to, first of all, tell everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for like, share and following. Please continue to do so. Share this with somebody else who's in recovery. The comments mean the world to us. So wherever you're getting this um through podcast or YouTube, please keep it up. We so appreciate, and we are building that beautiful community. It's really great. You know, we did launch our new website before we took our little week break, yes. and that's been good. And if you guys are not a member, definitely join because there's a ton of benefits there. I just sent out, uh, we sent something out Saturday morning, a little email with some exclusive content that you made about codependency. So yes. if you guys are not a member, definitely join in. Uh, now, so we've got we kind go. of an unusual episode today. Um, I, this is actually my 29th year of continuous sobriety. So I'm celebrating got, 29th on the 8th. You uh, got 8th sober and 9th, right? when you were like five, right? Yeah, well, it was this week. It was it was this it was this week. Yeah, four actually. I got sober. four. Okay. <laughs> I wish I would. I did get sober young. I got sober in my late twenties. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it was it was you know I was still fairly young. Uh, yes. At that time, I was super young, like in the nineties, like super young. Now, right. not so much. Like I see kids <laughs> that are coming in there, you know, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. It, crazy. Absolutely. You know, I, I can't even imagine that. Absolutely. And, you know, I was hoping that you would share a little bit about, you know, what it was like. Um, I, too, got sober in, you know, at 27. And you're right. We were the young ones when we first got into the program. <clears throat> but I I know many people who stopped drinking before they had the, you know, before they became legal to drink. So it is yeah. possible. And uh, I'd like you to know, I mean, this is 29 years in a row, right? Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Um, you know, first of all, I'd have to say that if I was going to look back 29 years to this date where I was at, if you would have told me that I would have been one living in Los Angeles, two uh, recording a show called the Recovered Life Show, all right. about sobriety and people living their best recovered lives, I would have laughed at you. There had been like the, no way that this would be possible at all. I, I just, it just was not in anything that I thought I would ever do, ever want to do. Right. right? Um, so it's weird how recovery works, right? It is really weird how recovery works because it will take you places that you never, that are great, that you never thought you would ever explore. 
Exactly. I mean, I'm in California and that's not where I got sober. So what um, what happened, Damon? What happened that, well, that it's interesting. made you decide? Um, you know, my, my story is not tragically unique, although it's okay. unique because it's me, right? Like right. I, I think everybody has their own unique story, but you know, it's been a, it's been a long journey for me. Um, you know, I was, uh, I, I get sober in San Francisco and, um, literally, uh, 29 years, uh, this to this week, I found myself at a payphone at, on Geary Avenue. And if anybody wow. knows San Francisco, it's a major thoroughfare that runs through, yeah. uh, to the beach. Uh, through the avenues on the other side of Golden Gate Park. And I was at a payphone and it was early evening and I was calling, I was calling a 12 step group. Wow. Uh, and this one was alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd never known anybody who was sober. Um, I never had experience with him. I mean, no one ever talked to me about getting sober. I mean, doctors did and people, when I had run-ins and stuff with the typical, you know, Hey, maybe you should try this out, but sobriety as we know it today, I, I never really knew anyone, you know, and I came from, um, a big family of drinkers and it, it was never possible for me in my mind. I never saw that I could actually live a life sober. Uh, it just wasn't wow. possible for me. Like I, ju I just wasn't in my consciousness and we know that, you know, Christina, this is all about consciousness. Yes. And, um, I like any good, uh, alcoholic, uh, I was totally honest. And I, and you know, I called alcoholics anonymous hotline from this pay wow. phone. So that tells you how dated that is. <laughs> and, and I said, Hey, I think my friend has a problem. With alcohol. Oh, I love said, well, it. Well, you love and it. your friend, and they knew, and they're like, you and your friend could go a block away and go to this little walk up, and there's a meeting there. And so, ever since I walked in there, uh, I never have had a drink again, which is a miracle in itself, right? No the but the fact that how I got there, what wasn't really traditional, it was like literally I had a voice inside me that said, "Hey, you have to stop this, or you're going to die." And right. why don't you call this thing Alcoholics Anonymous? And really, honestly, I'm trying to think back, Christina, mm -hmm. which is crazy. You know, everybody has these like little God shop moments in recovery. But I'm trying to think back to think, where did I hear about Alcoholics Anonymous? And I, I for, the, for the life of me, I can't remember. I, I, I just, right. I, I don't, I, it just came in as a voice that said, you should, you should do this. Well, and it's so good that you share that because- I mean, it sounds very similar to mine. I didn't think about Alcoholics Anonymous. I could barely remember. I think that the, they did a commercial. Maybe it was the only time they ever did a commercial where they passed candles <laughs> and they introduced themselves. You know, I'm Christine and I'm an alcoholic. It's the only time I ever remembered it. And I, I too, had no idea that not drinking was a possibility. And maybe that sounds strange. And it's for me, one of the reasons why I love being involved in recovered life. And I love the mental health concern that our Gen Z's yeah. have and the openness, because, you know, in 97, when I was, when I got sober and you must've been, let's try to do math here. 93, 93. 93. Yeah. Oh, look at that. My teacher would be proud. So in 93, people didn't talk about it. Right. I mean, I didn't know. It like wasn't as hip now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as hip. And I'll tell you, one of the interesting things about this is not only had I not known anybody was sober, I had knew no one that was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew no one that was in NA. I knew no one that was in, you know, drugs aren't really part of my story. That was I, sure. alcohol is my story, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to stick to what's true for me. But I knew no one in the recovery community. I knew no, no therapist. I knew no, like literally for me walking in. And I'll tell you what a greenhorn I was when I walked in. So if anybody is afraid to go to a meeting because they might not know what's going on, like we're all control freaks, alcoholics, right? Sure, sure. Especially when we're using. I walked in. I was shocked when they said that you can't drink again. Right. Like I was like, no, there's got to be another way. Like I, there has got to be another way. Oh my gosh. I'm over here cheering for those of you that are just listening because that was my exact experience too. So, you know, if you have a loved one who is, you know, maybe not ready to hold on to this belief that you can have sobriety every day, sobriety, you can do it for years at a time. Um, you know, let uh, let them feel that way for a little bit, because I really believe that we get scared enough to go. At least that was my experience. And then after, you know, a little bit gets revealed after three months, you start thinking, 
oh, maybe there is a possibility I could do this. But I didn't come thinking that I was never going to drink again. And I was in outpatient rehab. And I really, really thought this does what? No, I came here to learn how to drink. And so I think I, I needed out, outpatient rehab. I think I needed yes. that, but it wasn't a possibility for me at the time. Probably, you know, and that's why I see, you know, as a coach, when, uh, when a family member or their medical plan or whatever offers Christina to go, yes. we, we have this all the time, like in the intervention thing, when they offer like, Hey, we got an inpatient or an outpatient program or whatever that can help guide you. And there's doctors and there's this, and it could like help you get off alcohol and set up right. the ground rules and all this other stuff. I'm like, Oh man, take that. Like, cause I didn't have that. I had to learn literally through the rooms. And I, I was totally scared. Now, I'll tell you a, a, something that is kind of unique to my story that when I went into that meeting, I was totally shut. Like I, they asked me to share and this meeting had been yes. around forever. I, I was like, I was such a train wreck. Like it was such a train mm -hmm. wreck looking back on it now. And that's why I have a lot of patience when I go to 12 steps and I hear people like have total meltdowns, but wow. I was shocked. I was like, well, I can't be an alcoholic because I'm in college. And although I was yes. barely making it through college, right? <laughs> like I can't, I can't really do that because like I made it through like, and they're, and they were just looking at, they were so patient with me. And I remember mm -hmm. they took me up to coffee. They said, you need to go with us. And they gave me a big book and they, uh, you know, and I, still at the end, I was like really shaky because I had drank that day, you know, and I'd lied about it. And, oh. um, they, you know, and then they, they, it kind of came out. I was like, yeah, we'll I actually drink that day and blah, blah. And then when, you know, it wasn't when the coffee was over and they were closing the coffee shop down, they're like, you need to come back with us. And these guys were rock band roadies, Christina. Oh, wow. The, the okay. Craziest. They were like literally in town. They uh -huh. were staying with a friend. They had me come over there. I stayed there till one or two o'clock in the morning and they walked me through what alcoholism was all about. Um, this is the funny thing. Um, I never saw those people again. Oh my goodness. I never, Eskimos. Totally. And I looked for them. And if you're listening to the show and you remember me in 93, uh, yes. please get, get in, get in touch with me. If, if you remember me for the early nineties, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. I, Christina, I never saw those people again. They literally come in like guardian angels saved me, set mm. me up, gave me the, but they told me what to do. Right. And, um, I went home, I poured out all the alcohol that I had, I did what they said. Um, wow. I think I called the guy actually, I called the guy and said, Hey, I, I did what you said. They are, I put the bottles here and you know, where and I think maybe I touched base with one of them or something, but like, I never saw them again. Wow. Never saw them again, which was really, you know, um, amazing how people, and I always think about this with service, Christina, like how, um, when I don't feel like it, when I need to pick up that phone and make that call or answer the call yes. for people is because somebody definitely was there for me. Right. Oh, you're, that is so, such a beautiful story. I'm really glad that you shared it. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think about who helped me and, you know, I, I've shared this before when we did my birthday special, I didn't even go to my first meeting until 90 days in outpatient. So it's, uh, it is an interesting, it's an interesting, you know, situation to see how each person gets sober and stays sober. And I know we've got to go to a break, but when we get back, I want to make sure that we talk about what you did next. And hopefully you feel like sharing some tips about who, who knew people in early sobriety and the family members around them and what they can do. It would yeah. be a beautiful blessing for us all. Absolutely. I will. I will definitely share, you know, I think getting sober is part of it. Just getting the realization and having the opportunity to have a little bit of wake up call, but then staying sober long-term is really what it's all about. It's what our practice is all about, Christina, right? Yes. Like um, anyone can, you know, maybe have a realization and shake off alcohol for a couple of weeks and then go back to it. Right. Like I've seen that a lot, but Absolutely. how do you stay sober long-term? I think right. that's the key and the thing that we offer. And let's dive into that when we come back from the break. Okay. If you are newly sober, trying to get sober, or you've been sober for decades and are looking to take your sobriety to the next level, the Recovery Breakthrough six-week transformation concierge coaching program might be right for you. Have Damon Frank and Christina Dennis 
build a custom roadmap to get you on the path to getting what you really need. Receive hands-on concierge coaching and stay focused and productive with our daily check-ins. If you're ready to experience your recovery breakthrough and start the journey towards the transformation you deserve, book a free get to know you call today and find out what is possible in your recovery. To find out more about Recovery Breakthrough and to book your free call, go to recoveredlife.us. That's recoveredlife.us. You're listening to The Recovered Life Show. All right. We are back from the break, Christina. So just uh, to catch everybody up to speed, if you're just joining us here, uh, 29 years for me. Uh, wow. Kind of a big, you know, it's weird. I have to tell you, it's a weird feeling, Christina. It is? Why is that? Because you can't believe it's so long and it feels like it was just yesterday or... Well, you know, part of it feels like it was just yesterday. Part of it doesn't feel like it was yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. It's like, wow, that, that took a while for me to get that, right? Uh, especially with spiritual principles. But no, it's really amazing. You know, first of all, I, you know, I have to say, like, I, I think I had um, something to do with it. Like, I, you know, mm -hmm. went to a therapist once and she's like, you give too much credit. Like, you didn't have anything to do with it. But it was like, I, there was something else at work, right, is what I want to yes. try to communicate. Um, and it's not just me. Um, yes, I showed up and did the work and I know we were going to talk about some of the secrets, yes. uh, of, you know, from my perspective of what we tell our clients about how to stay sober long-term about, because both of us have long-term sobriety Yes, and, um, we know how rare that is. It honestly. is, it is, you know, although if you make it to five years, 85% of us stay sober. So it's always, really important to know that there are a lot of people out there that have lived and are living successful lives without alcohol. And I think it's, um, you know, because we talk about next level, living your best recovered life, I think that sometimes, you know, and you and I teach people how to do that and maybe get to it a little faster, we might uh, sometimes look over, overlook some of the first steps. And did you like, go to a meeting the very next day? How did you move forward? You know, um, not really. I was not scared. Really. Uh -huh. And over a couple of years, I, you know, I ended up going to meetings. Um, I, I did everything that people told me not to do. Right. And this is why I also have patience in, you know, <laughs> coaching with people who are coming from like, I just got sober. Now I got to live my life. Right. I mm -hmm. went out of town. Uh, oh. to pick up a, a girlfriend that I had to bring her back. Right. It's a total debacle. Uh, right. You know, her parents drank the whole thing. I was just scared straight, right? I had like a week before I did that or something. Uh, hor horrible. Uh, I was tending bar. Uh, that's how oh, I made money, yes. right? Like, yes. Um, so, and all everybody that I knew, everybody that was left in my life was an alcoholic, right? Right. Uh, for the most part. Or wasn't yes. speaking to me, right? They either weren't speaking to me or weren't alcoholic, right? You know you know what that's like. And so- Yes, I do. Uh, didn't have a lot of options. Didn't have a lot of options. So out of money, out of time, have to stay sober. I ended up going to meetings uh, like within a day or so. I was very sick. You know, I didn't feel mm -hmm. good like a lot of people don't when you're detoxing from alcohol. Uh, so there's that detox process, right? Which actually lasts much longer than a couple of days because yes. psychologically, a lot of things are happening to you, right? Like your thinking's not super clear. Um, right. And then I met some people that totally changed my life. You know, I, I I got a sponsor, and he and his wife were both in the in in the program. And they, you know, shout out to Kevin, who's out there, and Christy, uh, totally changed my life. Uh, wow. I mean, I would not be here now if it was not for them, right? Um, and then the rest is you know doing things a day, you know, a day at a time, which is the secret I think you and I want to talk about today. Absolutely. And it's obnoxious. I'm going to say that up front. You know, you will hear this. I mean, and I learn this lesson probably on a daily, daily basis. There may be a moment where I really understand I have to live one day at a time, but somehow I get a little slippery and I'm in the future and I'm in the past. And, uh, you know, it is so important to get 
someone to walk you through this process. And I'm glad you brought up about how sick you were because, you know, as interventionists, we know that statistically alcohol is still the most dangerous drug to detox from. Um, and definitely you don't want to do it alone. But uh, tell us, how long did it take you to learn how to live one one day at a time, one moment at a time? You know, I think I'm still in that uh, journey. I <laughs> Me mean, too. I, I don't think it really, honestly, I don't, we, we talk about this all the time. It's like, God, I thought I'd be past this by now. And then something amazing happens and we realize, oh, it's because we're able to live one day at a time. Right. Um, right. Look, I, I, for me, you know, I always tell people when I first meet them, it's like, I don't, if they say, I don't think I could get sober. I always say, you know what, man, if I can get sober, anyone can. And I, and I mean that because like, I have a couple core tenets that were just instilled in me early on. One is surrender is not an option. Right. It's just wow. not I'm like just of die course. fighting. Right. Like of that's course. in my, that's in my core. And the other thing is a powerless and unmanageability or a no go for me. Right. <laughs> so for, if, if I can do it, if I could do it, anyone can do it. Cause you, you know, I, I, I share openly on the show that I hate that. I yes. hate it. Like I think, I think sobriety would be great if we could drink and, <laughs> and have, you know, look, I'm being honest and, and have, yeah. uh, and, 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 and we don't have to worry about powerlessness and their manageability. It just doesn't work that way. Right. And yeah. I say that kind of taken, uh, you know, kind of as a joke, um, I don't want to drink. I, I don't have any uh, desire to do that because uh, I, I know what it's like to live sober. But I think, I, I think the secret, honestly, um, and we are talking about this in my unstuck room. What's, what's the secret to massive change? You know, right. cause everybody gets sober, they're sober day. They're like, I need to make massive changes in my life. Right. What is that catalyst? I think really it's three things. I think self-awareness mm -hmm. is like, Agreed. Oh, I have an alcohol and drug problem. I I'm addicted to this, uh, you know, and then the acceptance of that. Right. Like, so it's just the awareness. It's just self-awareness. It's like, I can't drink like a normal person. Right? right. And then second, I think is the willingness to change. You have to have a willingness mm -hmm. to actually do something about it. And then the third, which is where most people fail, is you have to start taking massive action. Right. And I think those three things, I was thinking about this episode and everything, like what could I share that would really make an impact on people's life? And when I speak, those are really the three things that have popped up in everything that I've have to do with my life in recovery is I had to become self-aware um, I had to be willing to make a change. And then I had to take that massive action. So true. I love that you share that. And I don't remember exactly what day, you know, in my first 30 days, but I remember the shift and the realization as I was reading, um, you know, something in the big book or stories about how other people drank. And I, I literally remember a physical shift when I could not deny that I drank that way also. You know, I could not deny it any longer. And I, I wasn't necessarily comfortable with the term alcoholic, but I knew I wanted to save my life. So I think that's that's the moment in which I surrendered. And, yeah, uh, and I, by, by the way, I'm not, I'm uncomfortable with the term too. Like yes. we, we talk about this all the time. It's like, I think that people think that after you're sober for, for a longer period of time, there's, there's a, the, I think there's some miss here is one that you're going to be totally comfortable with being powerless and unmanageable. You're going to be totally <laughs> right. comfortable with being an alcoholic. Uh, no, not, not necessarily in, in my no. case. Um, and then the second thing I think that uh, people think is that their relationship with alcohol is going to change, that they're now going to see, oh, you know, and this is where I think a lot of people beat themselves up. They might have a craving after mm -hmm. they have years of sobriety and beat themselves up to say, well, why am I doing this? I'm not doing it right. No, that, that that's what an alcoholic means, right? You, your relationship with alcohol is not normal. If you have an un, I don't think about drinking alcohol and having a, a sip of Chardonnay, no. right? And watching the sunset. That's not, that's not the relationship I have with alcohol. And I will tell you 29 years later into this date, I still don't think like that. If I'm no. going to think about drinking, it would be about abusing alcohol. It's not about controlling drink. I have no desire to control my drinking. I, I so agree. And you know, there are 
new medications. Naltrexone is one of them. And you take it about an hour before and, and then you don't get the effects of alcohol. And I think it's kind of odd because I don't, wouldn't want to drink it. You know, I think we know more about the actual effects of alcohol on our brain now than we did, but somewhere, you know, they could explain that phenomena of craving. Mm. And I believe that phenomena of craving is really what made me distinct from my party animal friends. I definitely was in the food and beverage business, you know, was absolutely the lifestyle was attached to it. And so I had to go through a metamorphosis to change it. Um, and I, I, I think that is that without knowing it then that now I can look back and say, oh, my God, thank goodness I had that that voice. You know, you said you heard an audible voice. And I remember an internal voice that said, you're not going to be around much longer if you keep doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's very it's humbling. Not, it's not normal. Like if people are sitting and listening to this, it's like not, and I hate using the words normal because mm -hmm. everybody's normal is different. Right. But if you're listening to this and you're thinking, man, like one, I'll never be able to get multiple years of sobriety. Um, and two, um, am I an alcoholic? Right. Like, right. you know, it's, 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 you know, uh, it was very, th this whole thing about the illusion having to be smashed, it's mm -hmm. not uh, a normal thing for a kid in their twenties right? Uh, to want to drink themselves to death, right? Like to have that feel, right? It, that That's not a thing. Like, so when we're talking about the relationship with alcohol and then time, my relationship with alcohol doesn't change, but my perspective on my thinking changes, my awareness on my thinking. I understand right. that that's alcoholism. If I have a thought that's like that, right? Mm -hmm. I understand that that's alcoholism and I'm less harsh on myself now, right? Um, I have so many friends who've gone out after 20 something years of recovery wow. Mm -hmm. because they were so hard on themselves about their inner dialogue instead of being able to step back and just have some self-realization that like, Hey, you know what? That's alcoholism yes. and I'm going to work on it. And you know, and look, here's the thing. Some, they say sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Um, sometimes those things are removed. Sometimes those things are not removed. Sometimes right. those things come back. But the, but I think the, the thing that time gives you is it doesn't give you a better recovery. I, I, I will tell you that because look, you and I know a lot of really, People have much more time than we do that are freaking right. miserable, right? Yes. But what it exactly. does do is it gives you empirical data and some perspective that you're going to be able to get through things sober. Right. Well, you know, and in my sobriety, there have been years without craving. There have. There have been years. And then something will show up. And, and I think as coaches, we get that call so often when somebody has, a, you know, a drunk dream you know, when they've gotten drunk and that panic. And you're right, you can let that take you out, you know, and, and generally speaking, people will say, what am I doing wrong? Because it showed up again. And I think it's really important to share that everybody in long-term sobriety has had them, that it's a wake-up call, a remembrance, it's a helpful reminder that our life will go to in, you know, my life will be in shambles if I make that decision, but it doesn't mean that we're, that we are recovering wrong. And I love that you said abstinence is really not recovery. It really takes Absolutely a huge not. shift. And so how did you, um, how did you stay, you know, we know that first year, uh, for most of us were scared to death. Um, and you're, you were around a lot of people who drank in your business, right? And I mean, for yeah. years, I know you weren't a bartender anymore, but you did a lot of events and things that it was around you. Well, I have to say, you know, before I answer that, Chrissy, I have to say one of the things too is I think a lot of people will come to us and they're problem drinkers. They're not alcoholics, mm -hmm. right? I, mm -hmm. I know a lot of problem drinkers. So like I, I'm one of these people that are sober that don't think that everybody's an alcoholic. Yes. Um, one of the trademarks of alcoholics is their life gets worse when you remove alcohol. Uh, <laughs> yes. And I was one of those people. Like uh, I was one of those people that lost everything, you mm -hmm. know, every, you know, friends, girlfriends, everything, everybody broke up with me. Right? Like it was like, right. it was the, I, I, you know, I was somebody, my life got considerably um, smaller mm -hmm. um, when, when I got sober and it got and it was tough. I, I'm, yes. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but I was sober and I knew that something deep down inside 
one of the things that I got early on is that I was lucky that the illusion that I could drink like other people was smashed. I wasn't walking around talking to myself. Oh, I could just go have a couple. I, I knew I couldn't have a couple like, right. cause that's where it had taken me. Right. So I think that is good for, for one is like, if you can smash that illusion um, and even I, not that it wouldn't talk to me because, you know, the committee in early sobriety is different than the committee in uh, later sobriety. When you have right. time, you know, it's my friend says it's cunning, baffling, powerful, and patient. It will wait for you more. Right. Uh, early sobriety, that committee that talks to you is much more like a young puppy. It's just mm -hmm. jumping. It's like, let's play it. Let's do it. Let's do it all the time. Right? Yes. So your, your consciousness shifts throughout it. But one of the things that it's given me is the ability to know that no matter what happens to me in life, I'm going to be okay. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I, and I think that that's when you, when you, when you find people who have time that, that have worked it, that are doing it, that are doing the deal. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm not, not, I'm not unhappy when things don't work out the way that I want them to. Cause that would be a lie. I, I'm very, I, you know, you know me, I'm like, a, I like to play full out and do the thing. I get very unhappy if I don't feel like he goes, but then there's a surrender of like, you know what, no matter what happens to me, no matter who comes and goes, no matter what life situation throws at me, if I stay sober, everything will be okay. Right. That's such a good grounding, you know, for us to belong to ourselves. And I think it's so important for you, for anybody to get a community and stay in that community. And they told me in the beginning, you will feel better. You will feel sadness better, you will feel anger better, you will feel guilty better. And, you know, I really grabbed on to those behaviors that were geared toward emotional sobriety, which I think is how I've been able to stay. And I know you do a ton of work around that to make sure that, um, that you are able to clean up, you know, they call it wreckage of the past. Um, and then therefore be able to have more evidence that shows you can make it through anything sober. And as long as you do, you are, you have a fighting chance. Well, this is, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting that I know you and I talk about this a lot is that when we talk about the self-awareness, the willingness, and then the action, mm -hmm. you know, I become self-aware of a lot of things mm -hmm. and then it takes me sometimes years to get the willingness and then sometimes I'll balk on the action or I'll do a little action and then go back and then say, well, I'm not as willing. Right. So it's more like an onion. I, I, I don't think, um, I, I think if people want to get sober, I think that they have to understand, especially family members, if they're listening to this is that many people think that this is like, um, you know, a self-help program, right? right? Like I'm going to somehow come in, I'm going to learn a bunch of stuff and then I'm going to get to this new level and then I'm not going to drink. I found it to be the opposite. I think it's more of a self abandonment uh, process. It's right. much more about what you're going to let go of in mm. order to be able to get to a place where you can shed that off and get to a new place. Right. So it's much more of an onion. It's much mm -hmm. less of steps, right? Like I'm now at 12 because I've done this, right? It's much more of an onion of where you're peeling back, peeling back, peeling back layers. And I think the secret to long-term sobriety is to not stop peeling that onion. Uh, when people stop, I think they become very vulnerable uh, to a lot of different things that could lead to relapse. Oh, that's that lands so well. That's very, very good. And I also believe you have to let go of so much of what your ego has been telling you. You know, you have to be willing to to be the person in the room that stays humble and open to all of the things that are coming our way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think, you know, thinking back, I, I you know, we're right up at the end of the at the end of the show here. But I think like looking back, uh, you know, somebody asked me, hey, like what what's the biggest thing that you have learned? Mm -hmm. uh, in recovering the 29 years is like, you know, and I've learned so much that I couldn't pick one, right? I can't just pick one thing and say, well, this is the thing, right? And I've, and I've made a mistake on that. Say, well, it's all fellowship. It's not all fellowship, mm -hmm. right? It's no. all internal work. No, it's not all internal work. It's a bunch of different stuff. I think it's be open. You know what? Be, be open to uh, not knowing. One of the things that um, I was very certain about God and about who I was and everything when I walked in 29 years ago, 
Um, I'm less certain about those things now. Yes. And I think I have a much better recovery because of it. I'm less certain uh, mm -hmm. ab about things. You know, we hear things all the time in coaching. It's like, well, if you put this implant in you, you could do it. Right? Like, and I think it's just like totally crazy. Um, and, and I'll explore it. I won't do it myself, but I'll like right. say, okay, I'll, I'll look at that. You know, I, I, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as closed off as I was when I first came in because I, I've realized I don't know what I don't know. And yes. I don't know a whole lot. <laughs> I say that all the time. The longer I'm around, the less I really know. But I do know that, and, and that's really the belief that is, as long as I don't pick up, I will have options and choices, you know, and I will, you know, not have that second problem. If you have a problem and you pick up, you now have two problems. And so that's, that's the beacon of, today this too shall pass we will figure it out and it always has well i'll tell you i don't miss alcohol mm -mm. um I, I i sometimes have missed what alcohol would do for me right. right and and this is this is this is the thing that i think people in addiction learn is like they, they don't love it like if you're listening to this you're like ah oh, my boyfriend my kid my whatever is mm -hmm. like look th there, there's nothing great about it Right. No. Uh, when you're drinking yourself to death or using drugs, abuse, all that stuff. There's nothing great about it. I, I think you, you nailed it. Like the final thought here is um, if you stay sober, the spiritual this is really about a spiritual journey at the end of it. it it's is. not about alcohol. And I always say this is like if you get that if you get that inner game right. Um, it's like, I always say the analogy with strawberries. I said it the other day with the client that we we're working on together, Christina, is that if straw, if I eat strawberries and I broke out in handcuffs and everything was crazy and they almost killed me several times, when I found out that it was strawberries, I wouldn't be going and trying to order a strawberry shake or, right. you know, I, I just, I wouldn't do that. Like people would go, well, that's crazy. You're allergic to strawberries or if you're allergic yes. to peanuts. You don't, yes. you don't do that, but alcohol is a different game. It's a different, it's not just the alcohol, right? It's it the sure result in which that it produces. And the thing is, is that, um, one thing I know for sure that I, I learned, cause I've been at points in my life where it's like, man, maybe the easier, softer way is to drink. Right. Right. Um, but it, it's not because the inner voice would say to me, Christina, just to end with this, that if you do pick up and you do drink, the spiritual journey is over. This journey mm -hmm. that you've been on is over. Mm -hmm. Whether it works for you, doesn't work for you, this has ended. And I know that that's the, I know that that's true deep right. down in my soul. So that's what keeps me going every day is I wake up and I say, you know what? This journey has been amazing. What's going to be next, right? What's going to be right. next? Um, despite how I feel about whether it's good or bad, I have to be willing to say, okay, what is next? What, there's much more to come. So, so good. So I, I, and just congratulations, Damon. I hope you're able to take in the day, the moment, you know, and really look at what a gift you've become to all of us. And uh, that 29 years is phenomenal, but also what you have done with those 29 years has been so I mean, you've saved lives. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and to everybody in the Recovered Life community, thank you. Uh, you know, I this is nothing I ever thought that I would ever do. I will tell you, mm -hmm. this is not, not nothing that I thought I would ever do. But it's been so great to be able to be a pivotal part of this and to be able mm -hmm. to meet everybody. And, uh, you know, my thought to my, my final thought to all of you guys is that, you know, you could do it if you're listening to this and you feel it can't be done. Uh, think twice because it, 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 it can be done. You absolutely can do this. And, you know, I hope everybody has their best recovered life because that's why we started this, Christina, is we yep. want people not just to be sober. We want people to live an amazing life. So thank you so much, Christina. Thanks so much for hosting this one. And uh, I can't wait to see everybody on the next episode. All right. Have a beautiful Monday. Bye. Keep the conversation going. Join Recovered Life, a community of like-minded people who are looking to live their best recovered lives. Membership is free, and you can apply at recoveredlife.us.